Um, but for now, um, we're going to get going, and I want to introduce um, Ben Smithy to the stage from the Smithy Group and Lux Intelligence. <laughs> there he is. Here he comes. Um, and Ben is going to um, talk about ease of engagement with the panelists. Did anybody here happen to see Ben's Green Book YouTube interview? Anyone? Oh, we got one back there. So I suggest you check it out because you might be in for an interesting treat that sort of aligns with happy hour <laughs> if you take time to watch it. You're just trying to run up my bar thing. tab is what you're trying to do. <laughs> happy hour is already paid for. All right. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Yeah. You awake? All right, excellent. You guys ready to get shit real? All right, because if we talk about engagement and we're boring as hell, we're doing a really crappy job. So I promise we're going to liven things up and we're going to have some fun. Cool? All right, that means you got to work with me, though. All right, my name's Ben. Uh, we're going to get stuff going really quick here. I'm just going to do some quick introductions. I believe we have Denise ready, right, on the, on the screen. Excellent. So our first panelist, uh, I barely made it out of New York to be here. Um, she unfortunately did not make it out of Northern Virginia, so she's joining us live via satellite real-time connection. Uh, Denise Bryan from AOL. Um, she's AOL's Senior Director of Consumer Analytics and Research and responsible for bringing all the voice of consumer to decision makers in products, marketing, and sales. Uh, she's worked in market research for 15 years and has an extensive experience leading to custom quant and qual research. And uh, she's also, in her free time, immediately regretting all of her decisions to enter adventure races like Tough Mudder, uh, which she said she, quote, never hopes to do again. And uh, Ragnar Relays, which I don't think this is a typo, including 190 mile, 190 mile, 190 mile running relay in Hawaii later this year. I could think of many other things Denise to do in Hawaii other than running 190 miles. But thank you, and let's welcome Denise to our panel. Next Hi, up, everyone. live in person, in the flesh, Mr. Dave Carruthers from Box Pop Me. Dave, come on up. Dave's been involved with the technology startup since MySpace was a thing. MySpace. 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 All right. I heard it's coming. It's coming back. It's making a resurgence. Uh, we can be. You can be in my top eight. Um, Good to know. And as someone who doesn't come from a traditional marketing research background, is always focused on how technology can challenge industry norms. Uh, and we're not working on circumventing the globe in economy class. That sounds horrible as well. Uh, he can be found teaching his three daughters how to skateboard and at home is severely outnumbered, which may be why he is constantly traveling. Um, and finally, so welcome Dave, please. One more round of applause for Dave. And last but certainly not least, please come up to the stage, Mr. Jonathan Price from Virtual Incentives. Jonathan is a pioneer in the incentive and prepaid card industry. Uh, he led Virtual Incentives to develop the premier virtual visa and e-gift card platform. His depth of experience includes leadership roles with American Express, J. Walter Thompson, an experience that lent itself well to developing Virtual Incentives' innovative technology. It works with hundreds of market research companies, many of you whom are in the crowd. So please, one more round for my panelists, and let's get going. <laughs> All right. Engagement. Let's talk about, give me the number one thing right now that your businesses are doing to better increase this thing that we're talking about called respondent engagement, participant engagement, human engagement, right? What's the number thing that your company is doing to bring to the table in innovating this space and helping uh, companies like AOL and Denise's company do better research? Uh, let's start with Jonathan. Sure, sure. Um, so the, the easy and first answer is just the speed of delivery. We have seen um, that the, the just the number one indicator of respondent satisfaction is how quickly they're getting that reward. Now, there, there may be a loyalty points program that there is some, some duration before they get that reward, but when you have deemed that they have earned that reward, how, what's the lag time and how quickly is it? Because the technology exists today and uh, you know, I think Chuck did a good job of, of talking about the excitement of digital delivery and using his his Apple Watch to pay for Starbucks um, in store immediately. Um, that same technology can be leveraged as an excitement and an engaging factor for respondents who've earned rewards to instantly get something and to utilize that incentive framework. Dave, what about you? What are you guys doing at Vox Pop Me? Um, so obviously we're all about video. So what we're trying to do is tap into changing social norms and give the respondent the opportunity to respond in their own words. You know, 
open end text boxes have seen a huge decline over the years. You know, I'm gr it's great, the color, the SAS, the short two, three word um, responses, which is, you know, really difficult to mine. Um, and if you think about the rise of the Snapchat and the Instagram and, and just how much more video has become part of our life, we're just trying to provide a different experience for the user, integrated into their survey um, and allowing them to respond in their, in their own words. And we're seeing a, a real increase definitely in the last 12 months over respondents' willingness to record video. Uh, and I think that will only increase over time as it becomes you know, more part of our kind of social fabric. Excellent. And Denise, I think we have you here. Talk to me about what you're doing internally on the, on the brand side. You know, what are the things you're doing to ensure that you guys are, you know, you're obviously leveraging good sample, you're use, utilizing good techniques, but what are you guys doing to make sure that you are getting the engagement that you want in order to get the data that you need? You guys are an entertainment specialist, a content specialist. What are you guys doing to make sure that you're getting good content? Sure. So I caught a little bit of the last session, and obviously one of the big things is mobile. I mean, we look at our traffic patterns. We see that 50% of our audiences are hitting us via mobile, and we know from research we've done that 70% of the time that's at home, basically sitting on their couch and what we call me time. So we're certainly making sure, for example, on our proprietary consumer panel that everything is very mobile optimized, very easy for people to be able to participate. Uh, exactly in the moment when they're ready to talk to us about uh, whatever they want to give us their feedback on. And then, you know, we also use some techniques we've learned from content research. For example, people really love to be surprised and delighted and they really hate repetition. So when we're thinking about things that we're doing in our panel, we're really making sure that we are using new question formats, that we're using better visual formats, uh, that we're not asking our panelists to give us the same information all the time, which is something that, you know, we really worry about, but we just know you know, just like they get bored if they see the same story on AOL.com or Huffington Post every day, they're going to be really uh, bored if they see the exact same questions in our panel every day. So those are a couple of things that we're doing to try to keep them engaged. So it seems like, based on these answers, that we're doing everything in a tremendous way to keep respondents engaged in all of our research. So we created this little awesome video I think we have to play to show just how well we're doing <laughs> uh, with that. Shelly, <laughs> 26, and I love taking selfies, especially the hour-long ones for four dollars. She doesn't look happy. Can we roll that back? Don't qualify. Like, Thanks. okay, she just got all the information for. <laughs> I almost pulled off Shelly, right? Ooh, pretty close. Pretty good. Pretty close. Imagine how frustrated <laughs> she'd be now. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of them take up to 30 minutes, and. The payout is very minimum, you know, anywhere from five to 25 cents. And then um, one of my issues, big issues with them is you get 85% through the survey and it said, oh, you don't qualify. Like, okay, she just got all the information for free. You already put all your stuff in your profile anyway from most of the survey things that you do. So why do they make you fill this out when they have all your profile on information in the first place? So that's one of my biggest frustrations. They ask you the same questions over and over again. If there was some way that they could, some, some actually some of them do um, keep some of the information and that is great, um, but some of them do not. And if they could just keep in your name, the sex, the, your income, uh, kids, all of that information that you put in every single time, it would save so much time and leave more room for the surveys, which I love. More of an incentive to even do the surveys that you can't take so that you still get a little bit of money or a little bit of um, incentive, even if it's just like money towards a uh, gift card or something. I think the biggest part for me is more of when they're like asking questions that probably don't make any sense to me and I'm like, why are you even going through this? Why is it this long? This stuff just doesn't even apply to me. And I think it gets to the point that sometimes I see why some people just are like, I'm just gonna randomly select stuff. Let's give ourselves a hand. Yeah, <laughs> great job. <laughs> uh,
<laughs> right, in all seriousness, this represents a small sample of people that have these frustrations, but it's representative of a larger issue that we're having with this thing engagement, right? How many people is, as researchers really get excited about sitting down and taking 30 minutes to do anything? We don't wanna sit through a pastor at our church for 30 minutes, and if we're not giving that time at church, we're not gonna give it through a survey that we're sending, right, for four bucks. Um, so here's the deal, video. We played video for a reason, because it's engaging, you guys were watching. You mentioned video, Dave, and why it's changing. You know, we have the Snapchats of the world, the Instagrams of the world, we have the Facebooks of the world. I mean, everything is mobile first, right? If you're a business and you're not thinking mobile first, and you're still talking mobile enabled, there's three words that describe your business. Out of business, right? So, seriously, right? Um, so, Dave, talk to me about why video. Like, how is that really changing the game within the research space? Why is integrating video in these surveys and in quant um, really change the game for engagement. We see what it does for the data side, yeah. but what does it do for engagement? Um, I think you've, you're hitting engagement on, a, on two sides of things. You're, you're getting both um, better participant analyst engagement uh, in terms of being able to tell their story and, and getting you know, six to eight times more data from them. Um, but then also on, the, on the, this kind of hybrid of quant qual meshing of this data, um, when that research is being presented internally, it's getting far more engagement on that side of things. It's that lean in moment you know, yes, you need the numbers, yes, you need to be able to back it up with robust methodology, but actually, the more powerful thing is, you know, what's more powerful? Was it, was it, was it the stats in the grit report, or, or is, it this, is it the videos like that that bring it to life? And the two combined together, you can actually kind of, you know, you buy into that story. You know, we, we, don't, we don't connect emotionally with statistics, we do connect with stories, and uh, I think as, as researchers, you know, uh, it's all about storytelling and how we can, we can bring stories to life. So that, that's why we're really passionate about video. Are you seeing difference in respondent sort of feedback in terms of the surveys that they're participating in that they're engaged in video or asking to be, you know, are people still afraid of video? Is this a misconception? Yeah, so um, there is no doubt that, you know, not everyone is as uh, comfortable as Denise to uh, appear on video on a 10 foot screen, um, but, but, but that's changing. Um, that's changing. De that's changing definitely. Um, one of the big misconceptions is that that only millennials will do uh, videos. And I think as you saw from from some of the videos there, this isn't a millennial thing. This is you know this is a people thing. You know, and if you ask people in the right way, they're incentivized in the right way. You know, they, they will do this and they will help help bring that to life. Denise, I want to go over to you. Um, talk to me about as a research. I hate this term, but as a research buyer, right? As someone that uh, you know, secures research suppliers to, sub to execute your needs. How are you evaluating the ability, you know, how does engagement, you know, come into play when you're making these supplier decisions? Like, what are you, what are you evaluating? How, is thing, how have things changed over time? And especially today, what are the things that you're looking for in the partners that you choose, purely based from an engagement standpoint, from an incentivization standpoint, all of that? Right, well, first I should say, I mentioned earlier that we have our own proprietary panel. And we actually worry about respondent engagement on our panel much more than we do when we're working with suppliers. I mean, if you think about it, it's an investment that we made. A lot of these people we actually have on our panel because they're users of our AOL brands. Uh, and so again, it's really, really important for us to make sure that their entire brand experience is good and consistent. And the worst thing possible for us would be to have one of our brands like Engadget come back to us and say, you know, some of the users our site all the time took one of your surveys and it was awful. So we really care quite a bit about engagement when it comes to our panel. But to be completely candid, when we're talking about buying sample, when we're talking about working with full service research providers, you know, we've got other things on our mind. Engagement is one of them, but turnaround time, uh, cost, and then sort of quality, truth, validity. Now all of those things, you know, especially turnaround time and validity or, or truth, those are going to be better when we have really strong engagement. But, you know, speaking the language that is really important to us who are making those purchase decisions, I need to know from the partners that I'm working with how they can prove to me that the engagement that they've got is actually going to make me get my results faster and make sure that I can actually really, really trust those results. So, again, it's not that engagement's not important, and I don't want to be the, the bad client that kind of makes the issues in the industry worse by saying I don't care about um, engagement because I do, but I'm not going to, you know, I, I really need to make sure that I'm getting the turnaround time, that I'm getting the, the better data, and uh, sorry, my computer screen just went away, so 
Um, anyway, so those are the things that I'm thinking about in addition to engagement. What about for your internal, your proprietary channels? Are there certain things that you're doing and evolving over time or certain directions that you're going and planning for for the future in terms of making sure that that, that satisfaction and you're not getting people coming back in and gadget or huff post saying, oh man, I took that thing and it's annoying me or it opts me out, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been an evolution. This wasn't the first time we tried to build a channel. Uh, and then in the second go round, we're constantly adding new ways of incentivizing people doing it quicker. In the video, people talked about being really frustrated to take surveys, get screened out, you know, a, a fair way in and then not receive anything. Uh, we have various mechanisms in making sure that if people come through our panel and try to give us their opinions, uh, we make sure that we give them something for their time. One other thing that we have the benefit of doing is we've got our panel armature tag. So we can actually get, you know, use the typical um, methods that we would use to optimize uh, how we deliver advertising or content to people by just knowing who they are and where they've been. They've given us the ability to be able to see that. So we can make sure that things are a lot more relevant and actually not waste, waste people's time to begin with. Uh, we have strict rules in place for our panel in terms of the survey length. Uh, we do split things across multiple surveys if we need a lot. And again, these people are in our panel, so we can go back to them in a week or in two weeks, uh, you know, we can give them something of value to them so that they will come back and complete that second phase of the survey. Uh, I feel like I was going to say one more thing, but I think, you know, for us, just really being able to have them in our panel and know who they are, it does save a lot of those uh, issues that people really get frustrated about with engagement because we're able to not ask them the same questions. We've already got them profiled. We already know what a lot of their behaviors are, so we can really focus on just the attitudes, which is, again, why, you know, why we have to do this kind of research, because those things we can't find from just looking at their user data. Excellent, thanks. Denise has hit on it a couple times. Uh, you mentioned it in your sort of opening remarks, uh, Jonathan, about in incentivization and you know, relevance and things like that. How are incentives not just the necessary evil of the group, right, in the room? What is what is the real power of it, and what are you guys really doing? Talk to me about it. It seems to a lot of people it's just like, oh, it's an incentive, it's this, this, and this. We need to, we need to solve for it. Let's just give them more money, right? What is the, what's the difference? Like, what are you guys really doing? What are ways that we should be really thinking about incentives as a powerful sort of asset, not just, you know, another thing that's sort of at the end of the funnel? Yeah, um, it's, it's really the, the lifeblood of the, of the respondent, right? So, I mean, uh, I think Lenny mentioned it earlier. That's value exchange. That's, uh, that's why they're participating. They're one of the chief reasons. They want to give their opinions, and they want to share, but they also uh, are cognizant of that value exchange. They want to be compensated fairly. So things like um, speed of delivery and what rewards we're offering um, are, are almost as important as that, that dollar value that, that is, is fair and equitable. But, but one of the other things that um, we do think that there's a, a pretty massive gap on is to do more with that reward delivery. Uh, so much it is thought of as just that, an afterthought. It's, oh, by the way, we have to pay these people because we told them, or they reached a certain level uh, <laughs> of that necessary evil. Um, but this should be like the excitement point and, and really just a, a huge valuable touch point for engagement. I mean, this is, the, this is the point, this is the media that we're providing that's delivering the incentive. So that's when they're most captivated. So, so big opportunities to um, reinforce why they participated. Any other objectives that you want to accomplish, whether that's referrals or social shares or populating that, uh, that email or within the mobile app, what their um, point balance is. I mean, when are they going to be more interested, exciting, excited than when you're giving them money? Right, and you mentioned you know, about relevance and sort of not only just speed of delivery, but the relevance delivery. And especially when we get, you know, we talked before uh, the conference, obviously, and one of the sort of aspects and the facets of relevance is the sort of global nature and the global economy and the global business today. Talk to me about relevance in that, in that sense and what you guys are doing. Yeah, so we've, we've put a big investment in, in global and, uh, you know, just to put it bluntly, I mean, I think we need to treat our global panelists in the exact same way that we're treating our domestic ones. So that their payment in terms of uh, speed of delivery and the choices and the cultural relevance, that those are all really critical things. So language, currency, all things that are really valuable so that uh, they're not thought of as an afterthought or getting a secondary treatment in terms of their incentive payment. 
so I don't want like a US based only retail store gift <laughs> card and I'm sitting in China taking my survey. Exactly. Right? And oh, by the way, I'll get it two weeks from now, four weeks from now at best. Exactly. I mean, it's just another element of taking advantage of the existing technology, particularly with digital delivery. You don't have to worry about the, the uh, speed of delivery because it's, it's as instant and it is connected. Any things that you can share within your panel and what you're using, how you're using Intrinsic today? Because I know you guys work together. You guys have partnered up and doing things together. What are you guys doing at Rocket Farming for that? Yeah, so we've seen a, a couple of different things. I mean, um, we have two kind of incentive models. Um, users of our app um, earn cash. Um, once they get to a balance, because it's about $15, they just cash out through PayPal. So it's kind of a quite a quick quick method. Um, but we actually, um, for studies outside of our app, we've actually been working with virtual incentives on um, kind of incentivizing users with gift cards and, and, and uh, kind of po around about the $5 mark um, to do you know, five minute survey plus a video is what we're seeing. Um, we actually saw about 105% increase um, in engagement um, when we switched from a gift card to just a cash incentive because it was an instantaneous kind of uh, delivered there. They had the choice of multiple vendors. Um, so yeah, for us, um, I think I think we all live in this world now where we need instant gratification. Um, we're in New Orleans, so I guess you can get that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I, th I think respondents, you know, um, you know, they they want here and now, and I think um, you know so much of this, you know, um, of g going towards building points and you know getting opted out and you know to keep people engaged now and to keep serving them that kind of core survey design and long surveys, you, you know, they're, they're just going to churn. Um, and obviously, because if you can't retain them, the cost of acquisition is so much higher than the cost of retention. Um, and that's a big problem. Denise, any other things? Talk to me about some of the stuff that you have your eyes on. You're probably, you know, as, as a brand that's as well known as AOL, uh, you're getting pitched and, and, you know, courted by a, a million different technologies, a million different new solutions and things like that. Are there any things that have sort of, you know, trends in the industry or things that you have your focus on right now? Um, as someone that's a client in the industry, are there things that you're looking forward? Are there things that you're, you have your eye on for the future or things that kind of uh, have, your, have your focus right now? Sure, probably nothing too revelatory. Uh, we are trying to do a lot more with mobile, uh, with video, within the moment. Uh, we are trying to remember that sometimes, if someone mentioned this in the earlier session, that sometimes we don't need to talk to a thousand people. We need to talk to 30 really fantastic, really articulate and insightful people. And so we're using a lot of those, uh, those tools that allow you to do video in the moment type research. Uh, and, a, and a lot more than we were a year ago. Uh, we're also starting to see some folks who are doing a good job bridging the different, the, the gap, I guess, between self-service tools, which honestly, on one hand, they're a god. On one hand, they're a godsend for us, uh, you know, in terms of cost. On the other hand, all of us, you know, we're losing resources as well as budget. And so, sometimes self-service is actually really, really tricky for us. Um, I've had it happen before where we've signed up to use a platform, a self-service platform, only to actually not ever have time to use it. And so, there's a couple partners that we're working with that are doing a pretty good job providing us some level of self-service but also really great account reps that help us actually get the most out of the platform and at times jump in and help us move things forward. And again, I think we're certainly willing to pay uh, somewhere in between um, you know, self-service and having some help to uh, help us extend our bandwidth and get those things done. Uh, and you know, for surveys for us, uh, I'd mentioned earlier that we had our panel linked in with our Omniter data. I would love to see us just doing that more, and we're trying to experiment a little bit more with that with even partners that we're working with where we're really trying to tap into whatever big data sets. Like we did a, a mobile study a few years ago, and so we actually tapped into a panel where we could get their mobile behaviors and then ask questions about that, and we use that to do a, a mobile moment segmentation. So just being able to really see us leverage big data with our surveys a lot more. You know, that's something that, again, for us is tricky. The people that are on my team, they're people that have a traditional research background. That's the background I have. We're not really the people that are used to dealing in uh, that big of data sets. And so that's certainly something that we would like to have help with. But that's also something that we're trying to do more with, again, so that we can actually uh, – what we want to do is talk to our internal clients about what we've learned about what's important to people, um, what their opinions are, and not try to tell them – that we surveyed people's behavior, even though we've got better sources of that behavioral information. And 
you mentioned all the, the sort of focus now on video and all these other integrations. Uh, it's not just even from a, a, an engagement standpoint, but you know, we've been talking a lot about quality, right? Um, it seems, my background, I started in the industry in the qualitative standpoint, right? In the qualitative side of the industry. And so it seems when I go to more quant focused conferences or sample count, things like this, we're starting to see this resurgence or this sort of coming of age of qual aspects built into these quantitative, uh, quantitative sort of metrics and methodologies. How are you, are you seeing that? Do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Are you using more sort of aspects of the qualitative to engage, um, you know, your panel to engage, sample to engage uh, in, in different ways? Are you, you know, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I definitely agree, by the way, that, you know, when we think about engagement, we've always done just so much better of a job on the qualitative side, uh, and, you know, and again, it's the scale issue. Um, we've got fewer people to talk to, so we can perhaps treat them a little bit better. Um, you know, for our panel, I would say some of what we're doing is that we actually take a little bit more time to let people know why we're asking them the questions that we're asking. Again, you think about sitting down in a focus group, and you kind of do this preamble with the people that are there where you talk to them about who you are, why you're asking the questions, a little bit about how you're going to use that information. That's actually one of the things that we do try to do on our panel, whether it's, it's right before the survey or maybe in some sort of quarterly newsletter where we go back and we say, here's how we're using that information. Because uh, I think that, you know, in addition to just incentives, you know, the other reason people give uh, feedback is that they want their opinion to be heard and they want to know that their opinions aren't falling into a black hole, that it wasn't a complete waste of time. And that something that I think that we've always done a better job on the qual side and we're trying to do a better job now with that on the quant side as well. Excellent. Dave, when you're using, you know, a lot of what you're doing is largely a lot of the innovation side is on the video integration and the cataloging and everything on the back end. Do you have sort of tips or tricks that you can give us to that work better in what Denise was saying in terms of how are you prefacing the use of video? How are you getting people to use it more often um, outside of just the environment generally becoming more comfortable with video? Yeah, definitely. So I think it um, starts in a few places. Um, first off, it's about letting the respondent know what they're getting into. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, sounds obvious, but then, you know, some of the um, people we've worked with, they just like drop the video question in into the survey. They haven't mentioned it in the invite. They haven't mentioned it in um, the kind of opening kind of intro screen on the survey. So all of a sudden they come across this video thing. They've never been asked to do a video as part of an online survey before they freak out and you know click skip and stuff. So again, it's about educating um, the user what's gonna, what's, what's gonna happen. Um, I think on the, on the other side of things, it's, it's also about kind of, if you look at kind of um, um, the video used in, within communities, again, it's that, it's that education. The communities where videos works best is where, is where the video's been launched as a question type to that community way in advance of it ever appearing in a, in a survey. So actually kind of engaging that and say, hey, we're launching this question type. Tell them why we want video, what, why, why, uh, what we're gonna do with it. You know, so they're, they're, they're properly informed, so it's, it's not a big surprise. So I think, I think that's key, it's, it's communicating kind of what you're asking for and why. I mean, we typically see engagement rates um, in a average length quant, quant survey of like five to seven percent of people willing to, to do video. That can double if you if you uh, incentivize incentivize that, um, you know. But we're seeing a lot now with um, you know CX is you know CX is and VOC is really creeping into market research this space because you know all these big companies like Medallia and the Moment and people like that they're all capturing hundreds of thousands of feedback surveys every month, and they're just going to start building panel off that data, and I think we're seeing that more and more within the industry how communities are growing and. I don't need to go to a sample provider because I've already got my community of 50,000 customers that I can run a lot of my studies through. So I think that's another big challenge as well. It's, it's how we can uh, you know, integrate and, and, and build that kind of uh, better engagement experience. Right, well you heard Denise say that most of her focus is a lot of the stuff that she's doing with their own panel and yeah. their own provider. They have the eyeballs. They have some of the most well-read uh, you know, content sources on the web. Jonathan, what's something that you wish when you're sitting there and your team's sitting there in their office, what are the things that you wish clients would ask you for your input for? What are the things that you wish? Like, man, if people would just stop, you know, ordering us to do this, but ask us what they should do on this, what are the things that you could change in their businesses? Yeah, you know, I think I touched on it a little bit, but just to expand, I think just doing more with the reward delivery and leveraging that, that's one of the, you know, my personal missions is, is to 
is to utilize that most valuable touch point we have of delivering the incentive to do so much more. And it's something that didn't exist uh, just a few years ago, but with technology and with APIs and with um, the only limitation being the, the uh, information that we receive, because that ultimately can help achieve more um, channel objectives, but also makes the recipient have a much more special, cool experience because it's personalized for them. Are you able to share any examples, uh, they could be somewhat generic if, if you want to, about what you've seen in case studies or real things that people have done in utilizing that sort of moment where in the incentive sort of delivery? Yeah, so uh, you know, as a as sort of a check the box, I mean, having the reward delivered instantaneously is, is huge. Um, I'll, I'll draw from, uh, we do a lot of work with advertising agencies, um, consumer promotion, but for other big market in addition to research. Um, but one of the best examples is in automotive. So the, the old model of, of taking a test drive and then waiting by the mailbox for your incentive to arrive has been replaced by receiving instantly a digital reward, which can be customized um, that tells you not only that, hey, here's your reward, it's available to spend before you leave the dealership, while you're still in the decision process. So not after you've already purchased the car. Um, but then also has the personalization element of um, what dealership you went to, what car you were looking at, and then has other helpful links. All these kind of things can be applied uh, to channel companies and research companies in general to help accomplish these ob objectives that we're talking about. Excellent. Before we, before we go further, I want to make sure that we open it up and go to questions before we run out of time for questions. So as we're going, uh, before we wrap up, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, any questions? Uh, from these guys, or also we have Denise Still on the line as well. And if nobody asks a question, I'm just going to start sh shouting off random facts about our sales. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. There you go. Uh -huh. um, what about this notion of sharing back results to the community and um, does that have any impact in terms of responder engagement from your perspective? So sharing back results in terms of, oh. Yeah, like yeah, absolutely. So I mean, you know, the last thing I'm gonna do is to say that, hey, the a, a monetary tangible gift card or a Visa prepaid card is gonna be the universal only attractive <laughs> element. So there's <laughs> lots of things that, in, that, that are gonna be incentives. Denise mentioned it that, um, hey, a lot of people want to give their opinion. So the, um, the uh, balance for that is to share back the, the aggregate results I think would be absolutely valuable. Hey, if you marry it with an incentive, even better. Some of the things that we've done as well is, is, is um, have an additional reward for like the best response. So the top five responses, you know, maybe everyone gets you know, one pound 50 for their response, but then the top, the top five get a 10 pound gift certificate as well, because then everyone's primed to get that that, that sample, so even if you only give it like five, ten percent, everyone kind of puts a bit more effort in. So that you do like a discrete choice yeah. model to see who the best incentive was or who the best response was. Or yeah, we've, um, <laughs> we have like a QA thing. And yeah. <laughs> um, Denise, you were chiming in there. What are some of the ways that you give feedback, uh, if you don't mind? Well, I was just going to actually add to what Dave was saying that we've done the same thing where we'll give, you know, for any survey, we might give extra points or extra chances to win sweepstakes for really good open ended responses, really careful qualitative responses. Um, and then again, I mean, I had mentioned, you know, for us, we're in a little bit of a different situation. We're, we've got a panel that a lot of the people that are a part of that panel are doing it because they want to make the products that they use better. So when we're able to say to them, hey, we heard what you said, we worked on this aspect of our membership product because we heard that you said that this thing was really bothering you. You know, I think that people feel uh, great. I, this wasn't, as I mentioned before, going into a black hole and that this is, um, you know, that this is, uh, that someone's actually hearing me. And then sometimes, you know, the other thing with research is, again, it can actually be really interesting content. So sometimes in our newsletter, we've just done really fun facts, you know, 72% of you think that, you know, Trump is going to win the Iowa caucus, that kind of thing. Okay, maybe that's not a big surprise, but, you know, sometimes we can give them some information that they wouldn't have, and again, it ends up being content for them. Excellent. Dave, okay. do you guys, oh, go ahead. I think that's where you, where you do see difference between the community versus the, 
the um, kind of traditional panel model is because you know, most people who've opted into that community actually give a shit about what they're giving feedback on. You know, it, go you know, figure. Yeah, <laughs> they 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 they've actually opted in. Whereas you know, when you opt into a generic thing, you're getting you know surveys about all kinds of stuff. But yeah, just because I match a certain age profile, income profile, and some of these things, you know, maybe it's just not that important to me. You know, whereas as Denise said, you know. If you, you know these users are passionate about various products within AOL, you know they want to improve that. They can see a tangible output. I give my feedback. The thing I love using gets better. So there's you know there's there's, there's that obvious. That's where I think it becomes really powerful. Thank you. Another question from the audience. Yeah. A particular study where you know certain targets are harder to come by than others. So. Do you have any experience with variable incentives within a study where you pay more for a particular target versus another? Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think we've, we've, do we've done studies definitely where particular segments we've had to incentivize more, um, more than others. Um, but, but we've also done a lot of testing around the variable nature of the incentive. So kind of what we tested, like one, three, five, and 10, and kind of, you know, actually, the incentive increased um, when we did a $5 reward and a $10 reward increased from like 5.4% engagement to 5.7. It was almost like, you know, when you get to a point where actually money isn't the issue, money isn't the issue. Um, it's, it's, you know, with, with, our, with our product, you know, there are people that just will flat out refuse to record themselves on videos. Um, so, you know, m there probably will be a price point, but it's just not gonna be economically viable to, to deliver that, so again, um, but uh, in terms of the variable incentive, I, th I think it just, you know, it really depends on what you're trying to get, who, you know, what you need, and, and also the time frame as well, you know, it's, it's all linked into that, isn't it? You know, how quickly do we need to deliver this? How tight is that, and how do we get that there? <coughs> Jonathan, anything to add to that, or have you have any clients that are? Yeah, absolutely, so variable denominations, uh, a lot of times we'll take that. That's one area we, we're often taking cues from from the research of the direct client. But you know, uh, having the platform and the and flexibility to find out what that that right plateau is, as Dave mentioned, you know, you're going to overspend if you jump too far behind. Um, so doing doing lots of testing and doing it up front um, is something that is pretty inflex uh, pretty flexible and, and easy to do now with technology and bigger delivery. Are you sending? It, are you seeing it spend higher or lower, or is there is there any sort of movement in that space, or is it just kind of arbitrary right now? Yeah, you know, I don't know if we have any conclusions on on the the shift of the value at this point. Okay, fair enough. In the study, or is that is that uh, is that sort of at the study level or within the study? So, the variable question that I have is within a study. Do you have variability between incentives with one quota or another quota based upon the supply and demand or the difficulty in getting that particular target within a single study? Which is a, which is a bit different than having variability from study to study mm -hmm. based on how difficult the study is. But I'm just wondering, you know, is there models that you've seen or are you doing anything that's actually addressing that issue? Um, there's nothing that we're doing right now that can speak to that. I don't know if Denise has got. Yeah, Denise, anything to add there? Uh, sorry to keep hanging. Yeah, yeah just uh, just that we do it. We've got the ability to, uh, you know, again, this is on our panel side. I mean, we're, we we sometimes give extra points within a study to the harder to reach population. Sorry, by the way, if y'all are getting that feedback that I'm hearing on my side. Uh, you know, and then in terms of anything that we've done with with uh, uh, panel providers, we've actually never even asked. So that's a that's a good question. The audience, I think I lost my slide. No. All right. Any other questions? <laughs> no more mic for you. Shut up. <laughs> um, all right, so then final wrap up things. What is your last sort of closing remark to leave this group with? Um, we kind of have an open platform. You're on the stage, so they're forced to listen to you unless they turn your mic off. Um, <laughs> what, what is your last parting words of wisdom or things? It's like if you could go out and do one thing to impact your business today, given the audience that's in the room, like what are the things like just do this and this is going to help serve your business better for the long run? Like one small 
change today, what would it be? I mean, it's, I mean, I've been coming to these events now for three years, relatively new to the industry, but it just seems ridiculous that we're still, we're still talking about, you know, getting things to mobile, and we're still talking about length of interviewing. You know, I saw uh, the guys, uh, I think FSI presented that the average interview length had gone from 23 minutes down to 19 minutes. It's like, woohoo, great job. <laughs> <laughs> we carved like three minutes off it. It needs to be like less than 10, probably five. You know, it, it's just like, I look at my phone, uh, like I, I mean, I have a bit of ADD, but I get distracted, you know, a tweet will come in, something will happen. I'm just not gonna take that, su that survey. And you know, we, we, we've just gotta put stop putting respondents through these completely bullshit experiences that are just killing us. Right. Absolutely killing us. And like, if we don't push back to the client, if, you, if we don't push back to the client, there will be no panel business. Like, like th that is gonna happen. So like, we either push back or there will be no business. That's my view. Well, I've got a similar, similar story. So, and again, it's mobile. Uh, mobile's a, a, just a, a crucial element and I don't think we see enough clients who are focused on it and using it in their evaluation process. Um, for incentive suppliers and and their uh, so incentive delivery, um, so the, you know the same logic of of having a mobile experience in in surveys should apply to that incentive delivery. And then I'd say one thing in specific that I would do that I don't think enough of any of our clients do is to really understand. Much like you're focused on what that respondent experience is for completing the survey understand exactly what their redemption experience and receiving that incentive payment is. Because not many do, and, and to just really appreciate what that respondent experience is, good, bad, and indifferent, and how that can be improved, I think there'll be a lot of self-evident things. Yeah. And Denise, parting words of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to actually build a little bit on what Dave said from the client perspective. He mentioned that suppliers need to push back on clients, and. I mostly agree with that, but I would actually say instead of pushing back, propose alternatives. Like I, I think we don't want to be part of the problem. As I've mentioned, we're, we're quite careful with our own proprietary channel about not breaking the rules. Um, perhaps um, it's a bad thing that we are not as careful on it when we're, we're working with uh, other channel suppliers, and so that's certainly something we need to work on. You know, not just pushing back and saying this isn't going to work, but saying to us, here's what we found works better here's a way we can help you break this up or ask this question differently. I know in the previous session, um, people talked about the fact that not all clients like that. Uh, you know, and so I can say that for clients like us, we're just so busy that sometimes the thing that we're reacting against is anything that's gonna add more time to our day and make it more difficult to get our survey out when we're already behind. When we've got partners that are actually working with us and offering those solutions, they're saying, here's what we could do instead, what do, you, what do you think of that? We're actually much more open to that dialogue. So again, I do agree with Dave. I mean, I think that it gets much more difficult to put these people through the survey given that their attention is already so fragmented. They've already got so many things going on. And frankly, their experience everywhere else and all of the other content they're consuming is just so much better than what we've been able to give them on market research side. Excellent. Everyone, please help me thank our panelists, Denise, Dave, and Jonathan. Uh, appreciate your time and being here. Denise, thanks for uh, toughing it out. Sorry you weren't able to make it here in person, and we'll throw a couple back at happy hour for you. <laughs> everybody wave bye, okay. Denise. <laughs> bye, Denise. All right, thank you, everybody. And again, I think...